the degree app today. But um, what I'm going to be talking about is just some basic cultural practices that we often see used in the greenhouse, whether that's for hydroponic production or normal soil production. But in particular, I'm going to talk a little bit more about hydroponic tomatoes and hydroponic lettuce production as we see it pertaining to greenhouse production. So what are cultural practices and why do we find these important? Why is this something that we should concern ourselves with um, when we're either setting up for our new growing system this year or we're just kind of looking to improve on our yields or improve on the type of management that we're using already? So um, a cultural practice is just any type of variable that us as the grower is actually able to exert some control over. So there's a lot of stuff that we can't control, whether that's the amount of sunlight we get in the greenhouse, whether that is you know, the weather patterns or the diseases that are coming in. But there's a lot of stuff that we do have a realm of control over. And by implementing certain tactics and implementing certain methods um, via these cultural practices, we're able to create a little bit more stability within our production um, and really increase our, our overall uh, crop productivity. So, you know, we're only limited by, you know, that, or our crops are mostly limited by that, that um, weakest factor or that weakest chain in that link. So by making sure that we're optimizing and keeping an eye on every single little factor of the system, we're able to really increase that crop productivity and then increase our economic um, value of that crop, whether that's through more yield, whether that's through a higher quality crop, uh, we're able to implement these processes. Um, I really like this quote from the Texas Vegetable Grower Workshop, kind of uh, uh, epitomizing why these cultural practices are, are important. Uh, cultural practices are the wise selection of cultural practices improve production efficiency, lowers your production costs, increase profitability, and with most successful businesses, careful planning generally enhances the incident of success. So by keeping these cultural practices in mind and taking uh, these steps, to increasing this productivity, we can thus make ourselves better businesses, more efficient businesses. Now, um, I've had a really good opportunity working at Crafting over the past couple years to work with a lot of different growers ranging from very small to big and all kinds of different levels. And I've really seen some, some basic steps or some basic things that a lot of our growers might be failing with or really exceeding in these, some of these cultural practices. So although this is an enormous subject, it can range from disease control um, to all the way to how we actually manage this crop, the, I kind of broke this down into some of the more basic things that I see are either failing or need to be a little bit more concerned with when we're talking about my growth. So um, in this uh, presentation, I'll talk a little bit about greenhouse workflow. Uh, some of our growing system and kind of crop sanitation, disease, to disease management in general, um, then we'll go a little bit into our nutrient uh, solution management, which we already hit on a little bit, but I'll talk a little bit more about um, how we kind of handle that as a, as a daily checklist type thing. Um, and then I'll talk more about tomato pruning and tomato foliage management, as well as lettuce management. So greenhouse workflows are just absolutely crucial in setting up a successful business. Uh, these workflows are basically the methods, the processes, or the routines that we go through every day. Um, you know, as greenhouse growers, we definitely fall into routines, whether that's um, you know, walking through the house and inspecting certain pieces of equipment, or just doing quick walkthroughs in the morning. But making a, a, a specific routine out of these, or making a plan to execute these routines, really leads to um, a, a lot more success or a lot better implementation of these cultural practices. Um, these routines or these workflows can also lead to uh, proper record keeping. If we do have you know, a plan set that I'm gonna go walk through with, uh, this greenhouse at this time, it really does lead to actually keeping these records, which we will use in the future to uh, kind of go back and back check and, and make decisions. Um, this also allows for us to more closely monitor our variables. So when we have these workflow lists, this is forcing us to keep certain things in mind, whether that's those diseases or whether that's um, what the crop is looking. By having a, st a specific strategy and a specific workflow as we work through the greenhouse, we can really pay a lot more attention and manipulate these variables in a way that we can actually see results. Uh, you know, we can change something, but unless we're keeping track of when we changed it or how we changed it, we're never actually going to know, um, was it this or was it that? What changed this greenhouse for the better or for the worse? Um, and this kind of goes into quantifying um, and, and being able to analyze the results of these workflows. So one of the, the base, most basic workflows or one of the most basic things that I really try to have a lot of my growers implement are daily checklists. Um, 
this can be anything from uh, you know who cleaned uh, to uh, who mixed up this tank to what our actual individual um, uh, our individual components of those fertilizer solutions are. Uh, this really does help to reduce work redundancy. Um, a lot of the times people will go into the same greenhouse if you've got multiple people doing your pruning work or multiple people um, checking spe for specific diseases. We can make sure that these are written down and again, um, being able to go and back check and make sure that yes, this task has occurred. Um, this also establishes some accountability. A lot of the times when you start to get into bigger greenhouses, um, whether that is just like eighth of an acre or even up to a quarter of an acre, and you've got multiple people working into that house, um, it can always be someone else's fault that this tank didn't get tanked or this plant wasn't identified. So having lists and having making sure that people are following these checklists can go a long way to making sure that, yes, this task has been done. And it also really helps to reinforce the importance, not only with your workers, but with you as a grower. Um, if you are making these checklists and filling out these forms every day, um, and you start to see these variables swing, or you start to see something changing over the course of that growing season, you know that there's a reason that you're following this. And again, it's all coming down to uh, uh, optimizing for that plant production and optimizing for your economic viability as a business and looking into, okay, this has changed over this, this period of time. Now, these checklists can be very, very advanced, or they can just be uh, you know, a set of boxes. I've seen growers that will use a big whiteboard at the front of their house that said, um, you know, did I check the um, EC of this row today? Did I look for pests on this row today? And really dividing that labor up over the course of uh, a week or over the course of individual tasks over the day helps to make sure that they actually are getting accomplished. Record keeping is again going to be absolutely crucial, absolutely key. Uh, when I walk into a greenhouse and I see something like that, uh, I know that that grower is actually paying attention to what is happening in their house. They're not just relying on those dosing equipment or relying on um, their computer system to know that, yes, I am actually feeding my plants what I am thinking I am feeding them. Um, the nutrient solution levels is absolutely huge as well. Uh, we were talking about looking at those dosetronic tanks that we have our concentrates mixed in. And a lot of times, um, just taking a quick look at the levels of those nutrient solutions can save you a lot of hassle if something is dosing incorrectly. Um, some other things that we need to start looking at are our pest levels. So uh, the best thing that you can do to maintain a pest-free greenhouse is early identification. And by keeping daily logs and recording, okay, I saw this amount of uh, insects on this leaf, or I saw this section, we're able to isolate the instance of occurrence and really make sure that we are uh, catching these things before they become too big of a problem, or being able to use uh, some of these beneficial insects or use some of these other control methods that we have early enough to actually get them under control. And without recording this data, you're often shooting in the dark. You can think, okay, well, this spider mites, you know, I had these yesterday, but without actually doing a count on, you know, a square of six inches or without actually writing it down, it's just going to be anecdotal. So making sure that you're actually keeping track of what pests you see, where you see them, you could really make a good map and make a good decisions on, you know, how far this is taking and, and when, when you need to take course. And again, this can kind of play into these spray levels. Um, by keeping a record of where and when we're seeing these pests, we can really not spray or not apply these beneficial insects to a point where we know we're going to have some economic impact, which can definitely save us a lot of money and again, catch, a, catch that pest or catch that pathogen before it becomes out of control. Uh, another thing that is really important um, with record keeping is our har harvest frequencies. Um, a lot of growers will really just kind of harvest when they see stuff is ready or whether it's a tomato, they won't really pay attention to the size of the fruit or the quality of the fruit. And when we're comparing to some of these uh, environmental condition records or comparing to these pest records, if we're able to look at what we harvested um, and then compare that to what last week's uh, nutrient levels were or what last week's pest levels were, we can then make decisions on, okay, um, maybe I need to heat my greenhouse up a little bit, maybe I need to increase the air movement. But without these records of showing what that environment was, what these changes we made were, and then the impact on our harvest quality and quantity, we really are kind of shooting by and shooting from the hip at what changes we're making, when we're making it, and how we're applying those. Uh, so looking at that quality in particular, uh, when we're looking at, say, lettuce crops compared to uh, fungal levels or pest levels, can be really integral to maintaining a, a really quality crop and, and maintaining some consistency over the course of that season. 
Visitor logs are another type of record keeping or another type of workflow that are incredibly important. Um, you know, a lot of the pests that we see introduced in the house can be brought on through your shoes or through that agricultural soil. Often if they're bacterial or if there's any type of um, um, pest issue that is on that soil, as soon as it gets into the house, it will start to explode faster. You know, we are definitely spending a lot of time and energy optimizing these greenhouses to make these plants grow faster, but the same organization is going to increase the speed at which these pests are going to develop. So making sure that we're showing some, again, accountability into who is coming into the greenhouse, actually keeping track of when and, and how, how they're coming in, will really lead to being able to sanitize it and keep those things a little bit cleaner. Um, another thing is that I've got a lot of growers that like to bring produce managers, or they like to bring chefs, or they like to bring uh, potential customers into the greenhouses. And a lot of the times these people are handling produce that um, is foreign. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean it's from another country. It could be from another county over or from another state over. But a lot of the times these uh, bacteria that, or, or fungal pathogens or pests that are from a different area really will explode a lot faster into these structures. And that'll kind of bring me into some of the, my next subject, or the next cultural practice, that to me is one of the most important things that we can do in the greenhouse, and that is our sanitation. Now, greenhouse sanitation um, really can encompass a lot of different subjects, but it really starts with your entry. So uh, what you see when we go to the salad days today is they do have a double entry system, and this is really kind of the first step into creating a clean greenhouse. So as opposed to having the inside of your growing area completely open, um, walking in the door and being able to um, directly enter the house, a lot of the growers that I work with will use a head house, and this head house kind of serves multiple purposes. A lot of times we will keep our fertilizer, or our, our environmental control equipment there, but it also adds a barrier or adds a step into entering the house where we can add some additional sanitation and some additional exclusion. Again, exclusion is going to be one of the key things to any type of sanitation, preventing the actual entrance from getting into, or the, the pests or fungal bathrooms or whatever it is, from actually entering into the house. Um, a lot of times our growers will use foot baths, just like I mentioned about agricultural soil having a lot of um, you know, uh, potential pathogens on it. We can use little mats that are either filled with a bleach solution or a peroxide solution that we have to step on before entering the house that can sanitize it. Um, I believe when we go to salad days you'll, you'll see one of these um, mats and, and you know, we would definitely encourage everyone to um, walk through that before they're going into that house. Another thing that we often see are either insect exclusion fans or insect exclusion nettings. Uh, what an insect exclusion fan is, it's uh, this guy, let's see here, if I can find the pointer. Oops. This guy up here. Uh, basically what that is, is an air fan that is uh, blowing a strong curtain of air from the top of that doorway all the way down to the ground. That curtain stops any bugs from actually flying into the house um, when you're kind of opening up into that entranceway. And it's effectively preventing, again, excluding any insects from entering into that house or um, into that greenhouse. The other things that we really need to pay a lot of attention to when we are looking at the sanitizing side of things are our pruning equipment. Um, if you are going to use you know, a knife or a pruner and you're doing a lot of the suckering that's involved with tomato production, um, tomatoes are very susceptible to a lot of bacterial diseases or fungal pathogens that can be spread simply by entering another wound on that plant. So if we're walking down a long row of tomatoes and that, that tomato in the front has some type of pathogen and you're not sanitizing that pruning equipment in between rows or even in between plants, you're effectively spreading it from plant to plant to plant to plant and again letting it explode into that house. So um, I've seen growers that will walk around with small uh, little satchels with little uh, dilute bleach solutions or any way that they can sanitize that pruning equipment in between individual plants. Um, so like Steve had mentioned earlier, greenhouse clothes are also a really great idea um, that doesn't have to be, you know, scrubs to enter a hospital um, kind of clean room, but having a separate jumper or a separate um, suit in that head house, again, never exiting that greenhouse, but something to change into when you're going into that greenhouse before you start working those plants. What you have to keep in mind, especially about tomatoes, is that these are some fairly small aisleways. Typically these aisleways will be three, maybe four feet, and you're going to be brushing up along a lot of these. So if you're out in the field, you know, harvesting weed or, or working out and doing some other type of outdoor agricultural work, you can often bring in pathogens on that clothing and be walking down a huge majority of your greenhouse in a very short area. So having something to change into and having something to change out of um, while working in that greenhouse can really go a really long way to prevent those explosions. 
Another big thing is our fan inlet area. Um, oftentimes, the back of our greenhouse we kind of tend to ignore because we're walking in through the front end, our exhaust fans are in the front end. We don't really look at that big vent door or those sidewall vent doors um, where the air is actually entering the house. But these areas play a huge role for harboring pests or harboring other types of pathogens. So making sure that fan inlet area is clear from weeds, clear from um, other types of uh, pathogen holding, you know, ponds or puddles or anything like that can go a long way to having them kind of enter through that house. Floor sanitation is another one kind of along these same lines. Uh, a lot of the bacterial pathogens that I'm mentioning that are particularly effective on, or excuse me, particularly uh, susceptible with tomatoes are actually going to be waterborne. So if you've got a really wet floor um, and that bacteria is oozing and kind of getting spread through that house, um, any of that can be spread and tracked through, again, either through your shoes, um, it can be moved throughout that house. So oftentimes I'll have growers will actually scrub that floor with either, um, again, a, a dilute sanitizer like a green shield or a bleach or a peroxide, just to make sure that the floor is sanitary um, in between those rows. Um, some other sanitation that is often overlooked is our wet wall. I've been in too many greenhouses that have wet walls that are completely dilapidated, that are, you know, kind of rotting because they're just really not paid a lot of attention to. And that's something that we can actually easily control. Um, you know, in that wet wall, we have a recirculating uh, nutrient tank, or excuse me, a recirculating water tank. And we can often add things like a, like a cleaner product or a sanitizing product to that wet wall in order to prevent any harboring um, of insects or anything from uh, in that wet wall. What we have to keep in mind is just like that fan inlet room, anytime that we're bringing air through this giant pad, all the air is getting um, dispersed over that plant, like Greg mentioned, sometimes up to one time every minute that entire uh, volume of air will be exchanged in the greenhouse. Um, so everything is being brought through that wet wall and it's instantly being exposed to those plants. So we need to really take a key look at these inlet areas and these wet walls and make sure that they're sanitized and we're not introducing all of these pathogens to the rest of that house. Um, another thing that I see that often get really dirty are our harvest trays and carts. Um, although, you know, you might be packaging into boxes um, or you might be packaging into sleeves or, or something else, a lot of times we're pushing little metal carts or plastic carts in between these aisleways and too many times I see dead foliage, dead plants, dead leaves that are kind of stuck to the sides of these. And these types of things can be then spread throughout that house again while we're traveling aisle to aisle. So making sure that everything, all these tools that you're working with are properly sanitized um, before and after entering the house is crucial um, to, to maintaining a, a healthy crop. Um, some of the other types of uh, sanitation that we like to see is our media and our container sanitation. Um, whether you're using um, a gutter system or you're using a Dutch bucket system or any type of containers, at the end of every season, all of that needs to be cleaned. Um, again, I mentioned that these bacterial pathogens can often harbor in, in nutrient solution that is left over in these channels. So making sure at the end of every year we're going through that greenhouse, scrubbing the floor, scrubbing these channels, um, scrubbing these buckets, whether that's with those green shield or, or whatever the sanitizing agent is, um, will be key to our success as a grower for that next season. And again, it's these type of cultural practices. At the end of the year, you know, you've been working for 10 months harvesting these plants. You want to just be done with this house and you know, take a break before you start planting again. But this is really a crucial time in getting the greenhouse ready for that next season. So spending that one month of downtime or that two months of downtime where you're getting your seedlings ready, cleaning that house, every inch of it, making sure there is no dead foliage. Um, if you're going to reuse these gutters even, making sure that there's nothing in those gutters or nothing in those containers uh, can go a really long way to preventing an explosion during that next season. Uh, with the NFT channels, that is, uh, like we mentioned, a little bit easier to sanitize. Um, what we do recommend is that you take off those top covers, you're scrubbing all the top covers, uh, making sure that there's no dead foliage in between runs. Oftentimes with NFT systems, because it is a quicker turnaround, we're going to be doing the sanitation almost every single harvest, um, at least wiping the, the tops of the channels off to make sure that there's no dead foliage or making sure that there's nothing kind of residual in those channels. Another thing that is often overlooked is our drain lines. Um, with tomato systems, you know, those tomatoes love to throw roots into those drain lines. And if you're going to reuse that drain line for the next year and you don't either flush that out or remove those dead roots from in there, basically you're, you're creating a rotting environment that your new, brand new seedlings are going to be throwing their roots down into um, that can then lead to infections throughout that crop. So emptying out that drain line, whether that is an NFT system or the bottom of a float bed or um, in a, uh, in a Dutch bucket type system, making sure that those are clean through that next season is important. 
And the same thing would apply to any of our feed lines. Um, oftentimes we can get roots getting into that feed line that will then decay and then spread disease through other plants. One of our next steps of packaging control, or I mean greenhouse sanitation that we often overlook is packaging. Um, like Stephen mentioned when we were talking about a lot of uh, russet mites or a lot of specific mites that will uh, be entered through the greenhouse, these are often contained in boxes that are taken to grocery stores and returned. Uh, you know, a lot of our customers think that they're doing us a favor by giving us our cardboard tomato boxes back, um, having us reuse them, you know, letting us save a little bit of money for that packaging. But in reality, that can cause a huge issue uh, because pests in those, uh, in those uh, produce centers can be absolutely rampant, be foreign, um, and really take over in your greenhouse. You know, we aren't typically going to have natural predators that will be able to keep these insect populations under check. So making sure that that packaging that's coming back into the house, or, or never actually comes back into the house, once it's left, um, is left there. Now, a lot of our growers will use um, packaging like plastic totes and other types of reusable packaging. Before those are entered back into the greenhouse, those should always be sprayed down, um, even as simply as just hosing it down with a dilute bleach solution, something to kind of kill any pathogens that are on that plastic material. This kind of leads again into some of our disease management. Um, disease management in any cultural practice is absolutely key. Um, basically, by keeping these uh, pests and these fungal pathogens away from our plants, we're able to get higher yields through season stability. So without having the pressure, pressure of different types of pests or insects on these plants over the course of the season, we can maintain a more even yield and a more even produce quantity. Um, we're also going to increase that quality. Um, you know, anytime that you've got a fungal pathogen that might be um, infecting a lettuce crop, or, or even if that fungal pathogen is affecting a tomato crop, we're decreasing the size, we're decreasing the quality of that fruit that is our end goal or our end produce. Some of the basic things that we can do when we're looking at some of this disease management is increase or um, are improving on our scouting methods. Um, a lot of my growers really don't do any scouting. They will walk out to their greenhouse, do their harvesting, do their seeding and kind of their daily tasks. And when they realize that, oh, you know, this plant is three quarters of the way covered with um, a certain pest, that's when they start to decide to take an action. So again, going back to those daily checklists, if we're able to routinely scout these plants and routinely kind of take a look at particular areas of the greenhouse or look for particular key markers, we're able to identify those pests earlier. So by making this a routine, you know, every Monday I'm gonna go out and strictly spend half an hour or 45 minutes looking for pests or looking for identifying some sort of disease problem. Um, something that you really need to pay attention to is checking underneath leaves. Um, we were talking, we have a lot of growers that are looking into basil production, and um, one of the main pathogens we see on basil is downy mildew. Downy mildew often does first display under the leaves without showing any chlorosis on the top of that foliage. So before you really have a grasp on how much it's affected all of your, your crop, it can really explode very quickly. So checking the undersides of leaves, looking in the inner nodes between your tomato plants, um, spreading in between where uh, the, the vines attached to the actual leaves is a really great place to, to identify where those pests are kind of harbored. Um, and then we can also just do some basic kind of key scouting, walking through the house, always keeping an eye out for any type of chlorosis, any type of um, necrotic plant, anything that's turning brown, um, any wilting or any type of foliage deformation is a really good indication that something else is going on, whether that is um, a pest or, or something else uh, nutrient -related, related. So these are the things that we need to be record keeping and these are the things that we need to be keeping an eye out for on that routine basis. One of the uh, first steps that we can take to uh, having proper disease control is starting off with a high quality seed. Um, you know, a lot of the times when we're using these F1 tomato hybrids, um, they are going to be a little bit more vigorous throughout that season. They've been bred for long-term production. So when you've got a plant that's been bred for a little bit longer production, a little bit more vigor throughout that season, it's going to resist these pest infections, resist a lot of these other pathogens um, a little bit better throughout the season. Um, another big thing, uh, kind of going back to down in mildew, um, there's a lot of pathogens that can actually be spread through the seeds. In tomato, uh, tomato wilt virus can be spread through um, seeds. So starting with a seed that is uh, completely disease-free um, and certified as disease-free can be huge. A lot of times these will also have a lot of disease resistance packages built into them. Um, you can see we've got kind of a nice long list here of some of the resistances that we see in this one hybrid. 
So starting off with something that you know, okay, last year um, I dealt, dealt with X disease, um, making a plan for that the next season by picking a cultivar that's going to show a little bit more resistance to that can really drastically increase your yield and drastically increase the quality of that crop throughout the season. Our nutrient solution is another way that we're really going to keep these plants healthy and this is, um, again, going back to kind of our, our daily routine. Um, anytime that we've got a healthier plant because the nutrient so solution is ideal, it's going to have faster growth and again, more resistance to some of these diseases, more resistance to some of these pathogens. Um, kind of an a interesting side note, I recently was working with a grower that was having some extreme powdery mildew on his romaine lettuce and you know, we went over everything. Uh, we, we talked about um, his spray routine, we got his humidity under control, we looked at all these environmental conditions, we spent a really long time trying to figure out why powdery mildew was getting so out of whack. And what turned out happened was he asked me, called me one day, and he's like, Max, my, uh, my B tank is 9% empty and my calcium nitrate tank is completely filled. He actually had a leak in one of his bellows pumps and he was only dosing half of the fertilizer that he was prescribed. But because of that, what he saw was actually a disease outbreak. So it actually didn't persist or didn't kind of manifest in any kind of nutrient deficiency that he was able to catch in that time, but what it manifested in was a large disease outbreak. So making sure that um, you are keeping that plant and keeping those nutrients in the right levels can actually lead to a lot less disease instances or a lot less issues when it comes to um, kind of those pathogens. I think. And then again, um, in, by keeping an even nutrient solution, um, keeping these, uh, these levels as stable as possible, also leads to crop stability or um, just general yield stability. Um, making sure that we're not having large fluctuations in that pH or large fluctuations in that EC will help lead to a more standard cropping cycle over the course of that season. Um, and again, going back to that economic viability, being able to um, have continual harvest, at least on this side of it. One of the first things that um, this nutrient solution really starts with, or quality of nutrient starts, starts with, is proper composition. Um, so one of the first things that you need to do is actually mix and concentrate properly. So um, like we just heard, using the premixed nutrient solutions really does make your life a lot easier, um, make it a little bit more um, efficient to not necessarily mess up, okay, I need to put in one gram of this and five grams of this. But as we kind of get to larger scale growers, those nutrient premix nutrient mixes do become a little less economical. So a lot of our growers will actually mix those fertilizer recipes by hand. Um, something to, to always kind of keep away from you. You always want to make sure that you're paying 100% attention, that your cell phone isn't sitting next to you when you're mixing these fertilizer ratios, because if you mix you know, just a couple grams more of one of these uh, parts into your concentrate tanks, that's going to affect your growth for a long period of time. Um, the other thing, like I mentioned before, is the proper functioning of all of this dosing equipment. Uh, we can run these computers all day, but by without actually back checking and looking, okay, this computer says I'm feeding an EC, I always recommend that my growers have another EC meter or one of the pH dropper kits that they can go out to their feed line and actually check that, yes, I am actually getting what my computer says I'm getting. We can spend money and time all day optimizing and trying to make these systems as easy as possible, but you really still need to be able to back check and make sure um, that this, this, this equipment is doing what you think it's doing. Um, and then the other thing is we do, on that composition side of things, we do like to adjust our fertilizer based on the growth stage um, and the age of that crop. So as we're getting a little bit older, we're going to skew a little bit more to reproductive type fertilizer uh, composition as opposed to vegetative composition. Um, and that really can go a long way into maintaining a, a healthy crop. pH is another crucial thing when we're maintaining this proper nutrient solution. Um, again, we talked a lot already about what it does for nutrient availability, but another thing that we didn't mention is that in our dosing equipment and in our feed tube, having a lower pH can actually keep our irrigation lines a lot cleaner. If that EC or that pH starts to rise a little bit too much, uh, a lot of that fertilizer can actually come out of solution and start to clog our feed line. So often we will skew closer to that 5.6 range in order to keep some of those uh, calcium uh, type fertilizers in that nutrient solution and keep those feed lines clean. Especially when we're talking about uh, comp pressure compensating emitters for tomato production, they will often clog with calcium and with other types of fertilizers and this can be due to having higher pH ranges in that solution. 
Um, another thing is obviously to monitor for fluctuations. Again, that availability is strictly due or strictly correlated to what those fertilizer levels are. So the more even we can keep that pH level, the more uh, available those fertilizers are going to be. Um, with any of these, cleaning and calibrating these probes is absolutely crucial. Most of the equipment will tell you how often um, you need to calibrate it, so it'll give you a little bit of a warning when you need to calibrate those probes. Um, and also replacement of those probes. These probes all have a finite life, um, so you know if you've had the same one for four or five years, even though it still might be calibrating, it might be reading you know completely off. Um, you know, another uh, almost identical example at a grower that was had an EC meter. He was um, getting some extreme tip burn on his lettuce. The EC was actually reading about 1.5 higher um, than what his probe was telling him. So this entire time, he was feeding it close to a three, and we were going through things. We thought it was his LEDs. We thought it was his airflow. We thought all these things. When it just turned out that he had a bad EC meter. So really going and and back checking these is, is absolutely. Water temperature, we talked a little bit about, but um, again, uh, having an increased water temperature, making sure that that water is uh, not too hot, sitting in the high 80s, can really help us keep our oxygen availability um, a little bit better. Once we get too hot, we can definitely start to have issues with some oxygen availability. Um, and we also, when we have warm nutrient solution, can also lead to bacterial infections. A lot of the times when we have pathogens that um, are, are bacterial, they will be a little bit more vigorous in warmer nutrients. So um, these are all things that we need to keep a look at or keep an eye on. Now, there's not a whole lot we can do when there is nutrient solution that is getting too warm, besides using expensive nutrient chillers or other types of piece of equipment like that. But at least keeping an eye on it and making sure that um, you know if we do notice there's an issue, um, that we can compensate and save for that with using another type of sanitation product. Um, when we're talking about some of that nutrient solution sanitation, there's a couple of different things that we can look at. Uh, light exclusion is absolutely huge when we're talking about any hydroponic system. Anytime that you've got a nutrient solution that is exposed to light, you're going to have algae. Uh, algae can be a harbor for other pests, can be a harbor for other types of um, uh, issues that we'll see through pathogens. Uh, UV sterilization um, is another one of the uh, kind of bacterial type of sterilizers that we often see used in large recirculating tanks, especially if you're talking about a tomato system that's going to recirculate that nutrient solution. We will use UV to basically kill off any pathogens that are in that water. And then particulate filtration is kind of the um, basic form that we will use to make sure that there's no plant matter or other kind of large things that are either getting clogged into your nutrient solution or leading to other types of infections. All right, so kind of moving away from the disease side of things, getting into some of the other cultural practices we see um, with tomatoes are some basic pruning um, and uh, uh, pruning and suckering kind of techniques. Now with tomatoes, um, you know, oftentimes we're going to run these a lot different than we run out into a, a standard soil solution. Um, in, in a normal hydroponic greenhouse or any type of greenhouse production, we're going to do a lot more suckering and leaf removal on these tomatoes. Uh, by removing particular leaves and leaf sets on these fruit, we're able to concentrate the energy from that vine to fruit production and not extra foliar growth. So we're always kind of fighting this balance with our tomato plants between having an overly vegetative and an over overly reproductive plant. And uh, one of the signs of having a, a vegetative plant is a little bit more of this foliar growth. So by maintaining a single leader or a single vine on that tomato, we can concentrate that energy and basically that money that we're spending to grow this plant on our fruit as opposed to making these giant bushes. Um, this can really help to extend our growing season by focusing energy on particular production. We're able to get that plant to produce for a much longer time. Um, by removing particular branches and particular leaves from the bottom of that foliage, we can also increase the airflow along those bottoms of those vines. Uh, this is really important for, again, disease reduction as well as maintaining a plant that's going to be transpiring quickly. Um, and this also will help increase our light penetration to our fruit. So if that fruit is completely covered up with leaves and you've got a bunch of um, matter over it, it can delay your ripening a little bit. Um, and will also um, kind of uh, uh, increase the ambient humidity around that foliar level, or, or excuse me, or around that fruit level that can lead to other issues. Um, removal of dead foliage is obviously key. This is kind of an extreme example, um, but if you leave dead foliage at the bottom of the plant, whether that's sitting on a bucket or actually attached to the plant, again, this is uh, harboring disease, harboring pests or other pathogens that can uh, decrease the productivity of our plants. Now, while using this uh, pruning technique, we often use a, a technique called lean and lowering. 
Lean and lowering is a way that we can manage our tomato plants so that they are constantly producing over the long course of that season while still maintaining good airflow um, through the bottom of that canopy and along that fruit level. Basically, with leaning and lowering, we let the vines grow to the top of this uh, wire or our plant support. Once that vine reaches the top of the support, we will lower it anywhere between a foot and three feet, depending on how often we're kind of doing this. Um, and then we will wrap it around the base of that stem, kind of creating a long loop of these tomato vines. What this does is it really does help increase our plant health by increasing that um, transpirational rate underneath those vines. It also increases the airflow um, throughout the entire house to pre prevent stagnation, which can lead to other disease issues. Um, and this also helps us increase our stocking density. So by maintaining these single leaders, keeping these vines all as you know, one big branch, we're actually able to keep two plants in each individual one of these buckets keep them a lot closer, and uh, have a lot more plants in there than if we were going to let these plants become very large and branched and turn into that kind of standard field type tomato. Uh, this also, this lean and lowering technique, also helps us lead to consistent harvest patterns. Uh, you can see here that we've got kind of nice weekly harvest fruit set where we're able to really, um, again, keep track of how much fruit we're getting per week and schedule delivery, schedule sales as such. Um, and it really does go a long way into, um, again, creating an economically viable greenhouse by maintaining some consistency throughout that season. Um, another thing that we like to do on our tomatoes is our fruit load management. Um, you know, a lot of the times uh, when we're talking about tomato fruits, uh, they will set anywhere between six and seven fruit per cluster, but that can get a little bit heavy for a tomato plant to handle per week. So in order to keep that consistent production throughout that season, we'll often prune that down to anywhere between three and five beef steaks. Um, obviously, if we're talking about cherries or other TOBs, that, that number would be increased. Um, but by keeping a sensible amount of fruit per week, we're able to balance, again, that vegetative versus that reproductive side of things, and also able to keep that plant from stressing itself out too much by putting too much fruit on at once. Um, by using this type of fruit load management and kind of removing smaller fruit and removing fruit that might not fully develop, we're able to reduce our B kind of level, so reducing the fruit that might not fetch that higher value and basically be having that plant focuses on energy on making fruit that's going to be the most saleable. Um, this, again, like I mentioned, creates a more consistent harvest quantity as well as quality throughout that season. All right, so talk a little bit about... yes. So how do you know how far you're going to prune uh, leaves of that? So, so it's going to vary basically on the height of your greenhouse, but typically we're going to prune um, so that we've got seven to nine leaf sets from the top of that wire all the way down to the um, down to where that growing point is. Normally, on um, kind of a normal house, it's going to be about waist level and down, that you're not going to have foliage and that you're going to have that fruit set. Now again, um, if you look at some of the Dutch houses or look at some taller houses, they're going straight up, so they're not having to do um, that, that same type of pruning, and they might have vines that are a little bit higher than that. But typically, you're going to want to maintain enough foliar growth that that plant can support that fruit, while at the same time um, allowing for a good canopy or, or, or good airflow during the bottom of that vine. So with, uh, with uh, lettuce foliar management is a little bit more straightforward. Um, you know, some of the things that we need to keep an eye out for um, our lettuce foliage is going to be a little bit more um, uh, when we're seeing kind of these dead fruit or these dead leaves at the bottom. A lot of the times when we see dead leaves at the bottom of these uh, plants, it is going to be due to lower flight conditions or an old pathogen, um, something that we've kind of overcome during the weeks. But by removing these dead leaves, we're able to um, increase the saleability of that crop. Um, we're also able to reduce that pathogen bank as well. Um, and then we can also increase our spay, spray efficiency. So by making sure that um, there's not dead foliage at the bottom and we're having a good open canopy, we can get our sprays kind of penetrating in there a little bit better. Um, the main thing that we'd like to manipulate when we're talking about our, our lettuce leaves and our lettuce foliage is actually our plant spacing. So um, in this picture, you can kind of see here that uh, I've got a bunch of channels that are punched on a four-inch center, and these are a slightly younger plant. And then as we get to an older plant, we can move that up to an eight-inch center. So by starting off on plants that are a little bit closer spacing and then moving out to a larger spacing, we're able to um, manipulate the stocking density of this house uh, by keeping smaller plants and taking up as little area as we can when these plants are a little bit smaller, and as they grow to a larger size, kind of continuing to spray that out. 
Uh, by having using proper plant spacing um, and using the, the right size spacing for the type of plant that you're going to use. So, you know, if we're growing romaine or if we're growing basil or if we're growing lettuce, oftentimes we will manipulate the spacing of these plants to increase the, again, that spray penetration, but also the airflow in between these crops and also to uh, make sure that we're able to let that crop grow to its total fruition. We talked a little bit about micro or microgreens or baby greens. Um, you know, if we're growing a crop like that, we're not going to be wanting to have these all on eight inch centers, kind of at this eight inch spacing. So we're going to decrease the spacing in between those plants, decrease the channel spacing so that we can increase that.